wildlife photography. Now, that's what we're going to talk about. But before we go there, I'd like to take a step back and take a step back about how to blend two different, completely different things together, art and science. So I have a quiz question for you, but you might have already seen the answer, so I won't ask it for too long. Does anyone know who... Let's have the lights off, please. Um, and if uh, some people can stand a little bit away from the laptop. It was working earlier. Right on. Okay. Who's this? Say it, I can't hear you. Lady? Yes, it's the lady who works with, okay, not quite the gorillas. Jane Goodall, synonymous with chimpanzees. But what's more important in this photograph is the stick that the chimpanzee is using. What's that for? To catch termites. Now this is way back in the 1960s when no creature other than us humans were known to use tools. Jane Goodall was the first person who actually observed a monkey, a chimpanzee, an ape, creating a tool, breaking a branch, putting it into a termite hole, taking it out and licking the termites off. It was a scientific breakthrough. So she told her boss, Dr. Louis Leakey, her observation and he responded, now we must redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as humans. So that's his infamous reply. But he also knew that her observation will not stand against the public. At that time, the public, that's all of you, everyone believed that tool use was exclusive to humans and humans only. So in order to validate her observation, he sent Hugo Van Lavik, a filmmaker, to go and film Jane's observations. And these films and uh, magazine articles and books that came out changed the definition of humankind as we know it. So we now accept that chimpanzees and a lot of other animals can make tools. But it's the blending of scientific observation and filmmaking brought together that brought about this change to the whole world. Now that was only about some 80 years ago. A few years back, I was in remote northeastern India. This is on the border of Burma, Nagaland, and these are the Naga people. They're known for their head hunting. Can we have some more lights, less? You guys don't need to see me, you just need to see the screen. So, uh, less lights would be better for me. So the Naga are known for their head hunting tactics and uh, for a long time they were uh, outcast for this until recently, until a few decades ago when uh, uh, Christianity went in, brought some kind of um, civilization in there, which is not always the best thing to do, but uh, they stopped head hunting at some point. And that's when I went in a few years back and I was amazed to meet and interact with the people. Uh, can we have the lights off, Yogesh? Can we have the lights off, please? That's better. Now you can see the screen. Now you can see what's behind these people. Remember, I'm in a place where I cannot communicate. They can't understand me. I can't understand them. I had a Nokte Naga tribal with me to translate. He could translate in one tribe about 30 kilometers away, but in this tribal village, he and I were in the same boat. You cannot speak. He could not speak any word similar. And that's the, diversific the diversity of languages found in this part of India. But at that point, I wanted to communicate, and, but there was absolutely no way until I discovered what's behind them that wooden panel, which is probably as big as um, this beautiful TEDx illustration here, 
was carved full of biodiversity that's found around that village. Elephants, pangolin, a wild dog on the top corner, the skull of a gibbon, and the people started explaining o o about these animals that are found around there. And that's when I realized that images, images transcend boundaries imposed by culture, imposed by language, imposed by human nature. That's the power of imagery. A few hundred miles away, uh, and these pictures, these images are what they use to tell stories to the next generation. A few hundred kilometer, kilometers away in the mountains of Bhutan, I found amazing paintings on the walls of these monasteries. And this is not very different from what I do today, in this day and age, wherein I, sorry, we've had a little glitch with converting from Mac to PowerPoint, but that picture of the, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, please don't do anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you see a little eagle carrying away a serpent, that's what I do today. Picture, a painting of a tiger and a photograph of a tiger that I do today. All of this is pretty much similar in content, in what it does. It's the power of the image to influence you. And that's my job as a wildlife photographer, to go out there, take pictures, show them to all of you, and make you care about what you see on screen. Does anyone know what this is? The purple frog discovered hardly 10 years ago. It lives 52 weeks of the year underground. Comes out only during the monsoon for two weeks and disappears again. That's the beauty of nature. We are still discovering new life, new creatures, in our, and this is all in our neighborhood. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, so these are all the, the kind of images from the Western Ghats, from different parts. What I try to do is capture motion, capture emotion, capture diversity, and bring all of this to you to make you want to care. Why is the visual image so powerful? We had several of our speakers speak about the visual images earlier, and there's one reason why images connect to us. Images connect to all of us. Art connects. And the reason is, whether we like to believe it or not, all of us are primates. We're apes. We are highly visual animals. We see with our eyes, and that's our window to the outside world and to the inside world. And what we see influences us because more than all our other five senses, our sense of sight is the most powerful, is the greatest. That's what separates us from a lot of other animals. And the other thing is that with this power of sight, we have been able to literally go beyond other creatures, cognition, and take it to the next level. I myself as a young boy was influenced by magazines from National Geographic, documentaries by the BBC. And at that age, I could not read the magazine. I could just see the pictures. Just seeing the pictures were enough to influence me and make me want to do what I, want, what I do right now, uh, being a wildlife photographer. But at that time, growing up in India, trying to be a wildlife photographer was as crazy and wild a dream as Deepana trying to land her spacecraft on the moon. So it's as wild and crazy as that because you have no direction. You don't know which way to go to start this career. So when my father gave me the camera when I was 14 years old, I started taking pictures and immediately my academic career took a nosedive. So the best career path was to fail in high school. So I failed and then my parents exiled me to the other side of the world to go and do hotel management. How boring. So I was sent to Texas to do hotel management and of course going there was another breath of freedom because I started to explore a very different country. I worked three jobs first and bought my first camera because without a camera I could not function anymore. And then I started traveling to Mexico. I met John Bax, a filmmaker, and I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be a filmmaker. And then I convinced him that he has to come to India, come to the Western Ghats, travel with me, 
I will carry his tripod and we'll make a documentary. So my university was happy, my John Bax was happy and I was like the happiest. I had told everybody and their mothers that I was going to be an apprentice. Something we don't hear much today because people are too fast to want to be an apprentice. They want to already be that person without being an apprentice. Let me tell you one thing. Being an apprentice can be the best and only way you can get into these kinds of difficult fields. Uh, I heard that you were an intern for a year before you started designing the spacecrafts and things like that. So, so that middle step is what a lot of people these days try to hurry past. So being an apprentice for me at that time was my dream job. One week before the trip, John called me up and said, uh, Sandesh, I think I'm too old to go to India. He was only 65 or 70, something like that. I said, no, John, you can't. No, 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 you're not too old. Don't trust me. He's like, no, no. Uh, I said, who says you're old? Alice says I'm too old to go to India. I was shattered. That was the end of my dream of being an apprentice. So my professor, Lawrence Loff, he asked if I still want to do the documentary. I didn't even know head or tail of how to use these video cameras. And I said, yes, what would it hurt me, right? So it's like, can you swim across the Atlantic? When you're 21, you'll say yes to anything. Drugs, everything. So I said yes. Next thing I know, I'm on a flight back to India with a video camera in hand, much to my parents' dismay. I had already uh, failed in high school. Now I've dropped out of college. Now I've come back to India. And what are you doing now back in the Western Ghats? So I did not go back to college. I spent three years in the Western Ghats and, and made a documentary called Sahyadri's Mountains of the Monsoon. Luckily, a few people thought it was all right, gave it a bunch of awards, and it got screened on Discovery. And that was a completely different path of life. And eventually, after that, I made a book. The documentary was converted into a coffee table book. And the book went on and went into the, to the hands of the ministers and it made a big difference for conservation. And it's this image, again, putting these images together in a way that can reach people in high places that can make a big difference. Now, that happened and a few years after that, my work, my films on the Western Ghats, my book on the Western Ghats were used to get the Western Ghats declared as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Thank you. Now that again is the power of the visual image. Your image can go on to influence policy. It can influence the, the first national park declared in the United States was also based on a photograph. And that photograph went on to create Yellowstone National Park. So, don't undermine the power of uh, the visual image. One image or 25 images per second in a moving image. So slowly I began to shift my focus towards not just, um, uh, okay, the book happened and then I went, to, this is my co-author, Dr. Kamal Bawa. He invited me a few years back to go to the Himalaya. And he said, Sandesh, do you want to do another book together? By then I had already lost half my hair. I said, absolutely not. But then in that high elevation landscape of Sikkim, 17,000 feet, there's very little oxygen in the air. What happens when there's less oxygen? You get mentally impaired. So I said, okay, fine, I'll do another book. And in 2013, we did a book about the Himalaya. And that just came out. And then I decided, okay, a lot of people tell me about, uh, uh, ask me about what it's like to be a wildlife photographer. So I tried to compress six days into a short film for you guys. So let's see if that will play here. The book was given to the Dalai Lama. Okay, I think the video is coming up right after this. I decided I'd, I'd create a company that creates content for conservation. Because of the lack of content, there's a lack of awareness. So I took it upon myself after all of this 
creating content in the form of books and films to make this content accessible to all of you. So Fellas came about with the motto of creating to conserve and we basically make documentaries. <laughs> Okay, so that's just a small clip about what it's like to be a wildlife photographer and trust me, it's a very boring job. You might not see anything in six days. I've had to spend months and not see things. So, uh, uh, I wouldn't recommend any of you to just jump out there and start doing it tomorrow. Now that said, this video should have ended a, f a minute before, but I want to show you another video Let's see if it will play without me jumping. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, I think we're working in conjunction. That's why we're switching two slides at a time. I'll do it. I'll do it from here. Okay. Now, this is a tribute to, um, to India. It's a, it's a short film dedicated to the wildlife of India. All of us know that during Republic Day, our country, if you turn on the television, we display our incredible military might, we display our incredible cultural heritage, but there's nothing that showcases our incredible natural heritage. So we took it upon ourselves to make a short film to reach the masses that showcases biodiversity around us. I'd request everyone to stand for the national anthem.
Thank you. Thank you all. So this video was, was released just around the time of Republic Day, I think two years back, and we had an amazing response on the internet. It got seen probably about three, four lakh times immediately in the first weekend. And then a lot of school te teachers emailed and uh, asked if they can please show this at their schools, to their audiences, and all of that. And so immediately we made the film available as a high resolution downloadable file. So if you go to our website, you can still download it and show it to people around you and influence them. Yeah. Um, lights off and the next slide, please. Now, one thing I want to make very clear to you is that the places where these animals live in the film that you just watched are all found in those little red uh, green dots. And if you add all of that up, it comes up to less than 5% of India is our protected areas, our national parks, our wildlife sanctuaries. Those are the places that provide us all our ecosystem services, basic ecosystem services, clean air, fresh water that we drink, all of this comes from within that 5%. Now, that 5% is what is under target by our own government. So we need to fight our own government in order to protect these places if you want to save those animals that you just watched on screen. Are you guys ready to do that? Yes. If we as a nation cannot live with the 95% of the land that we already occupy, how much difference is this 5% going to make? It's going to destroy the, la the homes of these last few animals. And that's the wildlife that stands so disenfranchised because there's nobody to speak up to these animals. They may be a pain to work with, but they don't have a voice. And in the work that I do, in the work that I show all of you, in the work that uh, you've just seen, I want to be a voice for the animals that can't speak for themselves. Thank you.